Hey everybody, it's Chris. I want to give you a quick rundown of what's going on this week. And, um, you know, it's been a while since I did a video. And I'm realizing this little camera thing is not lined up correctly. It's been a while since I did a video, and I want to get back in the, into the habit of doing that. Got to figure out my camera situation. I've been, that's, you know, I let some technology stuff hold me up from, from doing videos and things. It's kind of bad. But anyway, let's just jump into this so I don't waste all your time today. I'll... Uh, maybe I'll do another video bemoaning my lack of technology prowess when it comes to videos. But wanted to um, just do a quick little little rundown for you. So what happened this this week? Bank runs in the Fed. Well, a few people. Some people actually have some clients who have private investments who banked at Silicon Valley Bank. I got one of my clients that Silicon Valley Bank is her client. And, and what she does, and um, just interesting from all different angles, and people just asking for investing questions. So what's going on with Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic Bank, etc.? Well, basically, these guys took in a lot of money um, the last few years because it w it's kind of funny because they think if you're a tech company somewhere in the U.S., you know, if, if you're not in Silicon Valley, by banking with Silicon Valley Bank, which also happens, I guess, to be very friendly towards their 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 um, depositors, they have very good customer service, makes you feel like you're in Silicon Valley, or at least you can show your investors you've got some some credibility there. You know, so we we don't we our office is not in Silicon Valley, but we bank with Silicon Valley Bank, and perhaps that was the reason. But all across the country, you've got a lot of startups that when they raise money from investors like you and private placements, et cetera, they dump the money in Silicon Valley Bank. They got a lot of money. You remember the 2020 with COVID and then the Fed pumping money in the system. Money was cheap. There was all kinds of IPO money, all kinds of money being raised for various programs. And so Silicon Valley took in a bunch of money because their clients took in a bunch of money, a lot of startups, et cetera. They didn't know what to do with it all. You know, they would, there's only so many mortgages you can issue, et cetera. So what they did is they just parked all the money in 30-year treasury bonds. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and just to give you the skinny on this one, for those of you that don't know, uh, they, you're allowed to keep assets on the book at your purchase price unless you have to sell them, and then you have to market them to the current market value. So obviously with rising interest rates, these 30-year bonds that Silicon Valley Bank bought during 2020, 2021, have dropped in their current market value. Now, if you bought a bond for 98 and it matures at 100, yes, and when it matures in 30 years, you'll get your 100. However, in the meantime, if interest rates are rising, that current value of that bond becomes less attractive because I can buy another new bond at a higher interest rate. Why do I want that old bond from 2020 that's paying 3%? These new ones over here are paying 4 and 5. So the value of those bonds in the current marketplace drops. So maybe from 98, let's say they dropped, or they're actually worth 75 on the books. But Silicon Valley Bank didn't have to update their balance sheet and reflect that over the last you know, four or five quarterly reports. However, some of the depositors started, you know, knew that they had the situation and started taking money out of the bank. And in order to, to fund the, the requests for the, from the depositors for their money back, they had to start selling some of these bonds. So some of these bonds that they bought at 98, they're selling at 72. And the way that gap accounting works is that once you sell one asset in a group, you have to then, you can't just sell that one for 72 and leave the rest of them on your balance sheet at 98 and pretend nothing happened. You have to go revalue the entire balance sheet at 72. And so their equity dropped. I mean, so their, their value of their assets dropped tremendously and it wasn't enough to handle the current deposits. So therefore, uh, um, you know, they, they, there was a run on the bank, people, and then, you know, then, then we, they had to come in and shut the bank down. The FDIC had to take it over. Now, that's what happened, all right? Part of the backdrop here, though, is, is that I want to back up and just talk about a thesis I've shared with my clients for a long time. And this has been slowly drawing out, slower than I thought, but it's happening. And that is that the Fed is trapped. We've been talking about this since 2012, 2013, 14, when they've kept lowering interest rates so that they had 0% interest rates for a decade. 
And they were buying bonds in the open market to keep rates down. So the Fed had, by this time, a couple of years ago, 12 tr- $10, 12000000000000 trillion in bonds. And pushing 0%. When you have 0% interest rates, do you think that people would borrow money and do some stupid things with that because the money's so cheap? You know, maybe you, you wouldn't need to earn that big of a return on your investment if you can borrow unlimited money at zero. I mean, think about it. Let's just always, let's always like to use ridiculous examples to make a point. Let's say you could go borrow a trillion dollars at zero percent. And you could just go drop it into the bank or into a bond to make three percent. Okay? You know, that three billion dollars a year you're making, whatever the heck that is, 30 billion, three percent, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, $3 billion a year you're making is gravy. You're only making 3%, but when you can borrow a trillion at 0% and then go make put it in something, you can make that nice spread. You can make a lot of money. The problem is you just have to use a lot of money to make money because you're earning a small spread. Kind of what Silicon Valley Bank was doing. But do you think a lot of other people might have been doing that over the past 10, 15 years as the Fed's pushed it? So what happened? Now the Fed's trapped. They have a whole generation of people that are absolutely 100% um, you know, addicted to the, this, 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 low co- you know, this low interest rate. And there's been a lot of investments that have been bought over the last decade at super low interest rates, et cetera. And the Fed is trapped because now that... See, when they were pumping all that money into the system, a lot of the money, the zero percent interest rates and the, and the stimulus was going in, we call that inflation, you know, increasing the money supply as the, as the Fed printed money electronically and bought government bonds with that money. Okay, they were, they were, a lot of the inflation that they were creating went into the financial system. They bought bonds, pushing bond prices up and rates down. At the same time, as bonds became less attractive, Stocks became more attractive relative because you can't earn any money in bonds. You might as well buy stocks, even if they're not cheap. And so, therefore, this stimulus, this money printing, went mainly into the financial industry. Stocks and bonds shot up like crazy. You, you, you lived it. You saw it. I don't need to tell you that. All right. But now that after all this time, that this this stimulus is starting to get into CPI, starting it started to get into consumer prices. And what's interesting is a lot of people blame COVID, etc. But you see, we've been talking about in the financial business since 19, since I got in in the late 1990s, that you have this emerging middle class in the emerging markets, you know, the Asian consumer, the other, you know, other emerging markets, this, this consumer. And what do they want? They want the same stuff that you have. Okay, well, it's been 40 years and they're kind of getting there now. So part of the price increases pressure, a lot of it has to do with energy costs. Because energy runs through the entire economy. You have the direct cost of energy, you know, um, gas stove, heating your house, electricity. But you also have the indirect cost, you know, the cost it takes to ship the food to your store, the cost of energy to manufacture your furniture, etc. So energy is in everything. And these guys in the emerging markets, they want what you have. They want a fridge that works. When they flick the light switch, they want the lights to go on. They don't want it to flicker and work only once a week. They want real electricity. They want to have a car or a moped. They want air conditioning. So we're there now where they, we were talking about it theoretically 40 years ago. Now we do have two or 300 million people in the middle class in China and India. And we have you know, Indonesians and all kinds of other people around the world that are starting to just enjoy more of, of the luxuries of life that we've had for a long time. This uses energy. And this whole, and there's a whole, this is a whole other topic, but we are no longer exporting all our manufacturing to other countries. So therefore, it's not cheaper to do those things. Um, and so in that case, because it's not cheaper, we're also not going to have cheap goods anymore. We can't just go send our manufacturing to China because they want pay increases and it's starting to get expensive there. So a lot of that 40 years of when we started you know, offshoring all of our manufacturing, et cetera, 40 years ago, that's reversing. Globalization is reversing right now. And that is also inflationary. And then you have resource nationalism where some countries say, hey, we're going to hold our assets tight here, our, our, our platinum, our uranium, our lithium. We're going to keep it, you know, we're going we're gonna to control this tightly. And therefore, by doing that, the price of those go up too. So you're having less globalization. That's a whole other topic I won't get into. But see, the Fed 
created this now. Now they're trapped because now that we have cost increases, what would offset this is a stronger dollar. And we've been having a bit of a stronger dollar as they've increased interest rates. But you see, you can't keep increasing interest rates in a stronger dollar without there being repercussions. How about all those assets that people bought over the last 10 or 15 years at, at 0%? You're seeing it now with Silicon Valley Bank. But look at some of the other areas. I mean, you've got, you know, see the challenge too is it's how much they've levered. I mean, 3% is not a high interest rate for anybody over age 40. We remember higher than 3%. But however, if we were at 0% and you go to three, all right, that is an infinite increase. If you're at 20, if you're at a quarter percent and you go to three, that's a that's a, a 12 times increase in the interest rate. That's huge, especially if you're levering tremendously. So it's not hard to see how things can get blown up. So today with Silicon Valley Bank, where else can you know where else could this possibly happen? Well, you know, visualize the private equity firm that borrows 10 to 20 to one. I just read an article that the private equity firm had bought Instant Pot, Instant Pot, which is a product that I use, merged it with uh, Pyrex and another home company. Instapot sales were like over 700 million during COVID in 2021, but they're down to 350 million. So that they're doing half the sales they were doing a couple of years ago. So you've all kinds of private equity investments where these guys came in, bought a lot of assets, thought they were going to turn them around and such, and it ain't happening. So they borrowed it with cheap money, but as the business declines and doesn't do as well, you still have all that debt you took out. And pretty soon you might have to refinance that debt at higher rates because things aren't working out for you. So there's, so there's all kinds of places where this can hit us. Um, this is Ray Dalio from... Um, you know, Bridgewater, you know, very well-known um, hedge fund. A lot of large investors use them. You know, this is, brings us to a much bigger, longer-term problem. This is from one of his, his, his uh, write-ups. The U.S. central government has very large outstanding debts and is selling more debt than there is demand for. So they're selling stuff nobody wants, what he's saying. And when there's too much money printed and provide creditors with adequate real returns, which lead them to start selling their debt assets, which will substantially worsen the supply-demand balance, okay? So... That's the other problem, too. We notice that in the U.S. government's interest rate costs have gone from their debt interest expense being $250 million or something, $250 billion a couple of years ago, to now it's close to a trillion dollars. We spend more on debt than we do on defense. And we saw this coming. You know, this, but it's just nobody did anything about it. So this is the problem. The Fed is trapped. The government's trapped. All right? I mean, if you think about it, too, it's just, it's just you know, what's the thing? So let's just review markets and see where we're at. So you get bonds here, right? You get bonds. This is the bond market, all right? Here's our bond market right here. We kind of bottomed out, and, and I've had conversations with mortgage brokers. This is very interesting. This is bonds, and, and rates go inverse to that. So this is the 10-year yield by the, oops, I just messed that up. This is the 10-year yield. This is kind of short term. But this is the 10-year yield shooting up, and then it dropped during the Silicon Valley banking crisis as people bought bonds to for safety. But you have bonds have dropped tremendously, and what's interesting is 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 that the re and and let me just pull this up too. Where's the where are those Bloomberg rates? I pulled up Bloomberg, Bloomberg, where are you, Bloomberg? No, no, yeah, they are. Look at this three three month government bonds for the uh, six month government bonds 4.87 percent yield, 30 year bond 3.8. So you're probably wondering, why would I lock my money in for 30 years at, at, uh, at 1% less than six months? And the, usually the reason that the longer term rates are much lower than shorter term is, is a couple things. One is that people are expecting a recession and they're expecting the Fed to lower interest rates. Um, and so therefore, I've talked to a lot of three mortgage brokers that I'm, I'm pretty close to. And all of them have told me that pretty much all of their clients who bought this year, and there haven't been too many and people actually buying new purchase homes, you know, they, 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 they bit their tongue and, and, and uh, bit their lip and bought the, bought the house at 65 or 7% mortgage rate. But they fully expect it or, and, and, or really think they're going to refinance at a lower rate later this year. So the whole world's expectations are that rates are going to drop. And what, what if they're wrong, though? You know, what if, uh, what if we get the, this is 1970s again. We think we get inflation beat, we give ourselves a pat in the back for a year or two, and all of a sudden just comes roaring back again. This is this could get ugly fast. So I mean, rates are are telling are telling us that hey, things are going to turn around, and maybe the rates are right. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe we will have lower rates later in the year. But 
But bonds, interestingly, are priced like people are still buying this stuff. I mean, when you have 6% inflation and bonds are yielding 3.8, they're losing 2.2 every year. So you wonder, why would people buy this stuff? Part of me thinks this is the Japanese buying this stuff because they print money like crazy. And and maybe, maybe to, to, uh, to protect themselves, they've been building up a store of U.S. bonds because they're, they're at full monetization and, and they're very close to Weimar Germany status with how much, you know, how, many, how they've monetized all their debt. You know, they, they don't even pay off debt anymore with tax money. They just rebuy it with more printed money from the central bank. So that's kind of crazy. But let's look at the dollar yen. You know, we had a really good run up in dollar yen. This was a huge trend from last year until the end of the year. And then for some reason it reversed. You know, I think people, again, people thinking, hey, well, I don't think the Fed's done, et cetera. See, I don't think they're done. I, I, I think, uh, um, you know, I think the yen, it's, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I think the dollar is going to strengthen against the yen. You're earning 5% in the dollar, you're earning nothing in the yen. And now there are some purchase parity issues here, but in my opinion, at some point, that's just going to blow up. Which makes me think of Weimar Germany when owning the stocks. If you could find some way to own the stocks of that country with the currency changes neutralized, you could do very well because even in Weimar Germany, when, when there was hyperinflation, the stocks actually preserved, I want to say, 75% of the purchasing power. So if you bought German stocks as a German citizen, you saved at least 75% of your purchasing power than you would have if you just kept it in cash. So uh, it, it's possible we could get the same kind of opportunity in Japan. Uh, stocks have been same thing as bonds, really. I think stocks, people think these guys are, are this is the market. Um, it, it's not down that much. You know, um, interestingly, speaking of prices, see this bear market bottom over here in uh, October? This is pretty interesting. This is Luthold Group. In October, if the October S&P 500 low holds, the normalized P.E. ratio of 22.7 on that date will signify the priciest, most expensive bear market bottom in history. In fact, it's exactly the same level reached in the August 1987 bull market high. So the peak of the 87 bull market before the crash is the same valuation level as the bottom of this market. That's how expensive stocks have gotten with all the Fed stimulus for the last 10 years. So and since October, the normalized PE has grown to 25 and a half, higher than all but three previous bull market peaks. So we've got bull market stock pricing right now in what is supposed to be a bear market. So this is interesting stuff. And you can see then if, if interest rates were to go higher, I think stocks would have a lot more downside, you know, in them a lot more because they're just priced. They're priced like it's a bull market. This isn't even really a correction. This is tiny compared to what could happen. All right. Uh, bank stocks. Um, you know, I think some of them are overdone. Uh, this is the banking index. Um, this is Charles Schwab which took a decent hit. They have some banking. I actually, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think that's not a, not a bad, possibly not a bad trade. I just, I don't get involved really. I don't, I don't really, really own much of this stuff. Uh, it's not an area that I want to try to try my luck, but you know, there are some related things. You know, there are some small banks like William Penn I've looked at. They just have a lot of cash. Uh, William Penn might be getting beat up, but they're at, they're at like 20, 30% equity. They, these guys just don't have, I don't think they've bought long dated treasuries. I have to check the balance sheet again, but this is a very well capitalized bank, but they don't really do anything. They have no, where they are is not very economically vibrant. So they're not banging out the earnings. So the stock hasn't gone anywhere, but they're very highly, highly capitalized. I always thought they'd be a takeover target. Some other bank would want all their capital, but I think the bank things hit or miss. I mean, I bank with Brookline and, you know, it's taken a hit, but <clears throat> you know, it's probably not, uh, um, um, you know, we'd have to read the read the earnings report, but you could say it's pretty cheap now. I mean, I, I guess I, I won't say that unless I've read the earnings and know where their assets are. But you know, that it's, I'm sure there are some there are some if you're into bank stocks, etc. There's some opportunities there. But what's interesting is is a lot of the money from from the market that when when the people were scared, you know, from from banks and everything, it seemed to cycle um, into Bitcoin, which is interesting. I actually. Uh, uh, I actually took a shot at a shorting Bitcoin on this double top. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. You know, I I, I thought this kind of this rally was kind of BS. <clears throat> you know, I I get it. Look, I mean, I'm sure every newsletter in the country was saying, "Hey, 
you know, look at this. This is look at this downfall of uh, of um, banking, etc. This is the weakness of the finan- U.S. financial system. This is the weakness of the dollar, and therefore, you know, we should own some Bitcoin. So I'm sure a lot of people bought Bitcoin. I'm sure a lot of Silicon Valley people who got scared probably said, "Hey, this this is the time to buy Bitcoin because it's kind of right in their wheelhouse." But you see, this kind of where it kind of just kind of top here, and then it came up, blasted through that. I mean, as it came down, I, I'm I'm taking a stab at the short side on this because. I could be wrong. I'm using options. My my risk is limited, but you know I, I still think Bitcoin. I get the idea behind Bitcoin, and I like the idea of an of a, of a currency that is outside the system. However, you know Bitcoin, you buy it on a you get a 1099, you buy it at Coinbase. It's not even hidden money anymore. It's nothing secret about it. So to me, I don't really think this is the this is the solution. But anyway, that's just a, that's where a lot of money went this this week. A lot of money went into gold. For safety, the same thing. It kind of looks like the Bitcoin chart. And if for some other odd reason, money went into semiconductors. You know, people are like, well, you know, we're having some trouble in the banks. Let me, I'm sure a lot of professional money managers, they, a lot of them have fully invested mandates. And you see this actually at bear market, at, at the tops in markets too. You know, these fully, these fully invested managers, they have to uh, own something. So they sell the banks and they probably bought NVIDIA and uh, KLA and some other uh, um Taiwan Semiconductor, et cetera, and bought some of these chip stocks. That's where a good chunk of money went. This, the chips are up 3% today. So some money swung into that. How long that lasts, I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is the Fed is trapped, okay? Inflation is a problem. The Fed may be raising interest rates, but not necessarily reducing liquidity. I mean, to be, and some people ask, well, you know, specifically with the, what they do with Silicon Valley Bank, they created something called the Bank Term Funding Program, which sounds similar to what traders said from you know, BTFP sounds similar to BF, BTFD, which was buy the F and dip. That's what people used to say because, hey, with the Fed printing all that money, every time the market dips, just buy more. It was like something people would just do all the time. Then it didn't work in 2022, and I think a lot of people were, were caught. But, but I'm, I'm going to call it, but since this BTFP sounds like buy the F and dip, and it's, you know, we, we often, uh, you know, bonds and, and things like that, or you know, we often use the word paper when we're describing, like, you know, bonds for... Uh, you know, the bonds issued by a company, I'll call it by the effing paper. Because what they basically did was they created another lending program to bail out these banks. Which is interesting. I thought the $250,000 FDIC limit meant something. But now that, you know, all these, you know, rich people at Silicon Valley Bank just got another bailout from the Fed. Yeah, you didn't pay. It wasn't taxpayer bailout, but the Fed did it. So it's an inflationary bailout. Another bailout for for, for rich people, which is just incredible. And, and they get on TV with a straight face and, and say this stuff. And then, you know, I don't think people realize how it works. They just created another lending facility to help this work. So, uh, but this is stimulus, you know. And what's interesting is Silicon Valley, just should, you would imagine there's a lot of smart people there. Why you would have more than a million dollars in a bank account? Okay, because it's not insured over 250. You know, so again, do we, again, do we have to bail out people that should know better? I don't know, but the markets kind of cheered this. I think it kind of reassured people, hey, you know what, if things get really bad, the Fed is still there, and maybe that's why they bought chip stocks. But the Fed is the problem. In the mid-1970s, we actually had, we had the same kind of issue we had last year where we had this inflation from the Great Society, and I think the Fed's chair name was Martin, and they printed a lot of money, and they had low interest rates to pay for Lyndon Johnson's ridiculous programs, and we had inflation. And then after raising rates a bit, the rates, uh, inflation dropped and they declared victory like in the mid 70s, forget the exact year, probably 75. Some, and then they lowered interest rates and then r- inflation came roaring back. And we all know what Volcker did by 1981. We had short term rates at 21%. I have a client who bought a bunch of savings bonds at that time and she was, she was compounding 10 to 13% for the last 30 years, which was fantastic for her, tax deferred and state tax free. I keep telling my clients if that happens again, that's where I'm going. But, but the thing is, the Fed can't create all this mal malinvestment, get away scot free. You're going to have more things like if if they keep raising interest rates to to combat inflation, we're going to have more Silicon Valley banks. It could be in private equity. I mentioned earlier the private equity example. It could be pensions, could be insurance companies. I don't know. But if they keep raising interest rates, we're going to see more stuff like this. And I'm just curious how how what other uh, BTF type things the Fed can come up with. To bail people out so that nobody gets hurt. Um, so this could happen, definitely happen again. So what's the action plan? Well, first off, for the average person, if you you got to get these short-term higher rates. If you get any money sitting at low low interest rate accounts right now, you're crazy. You should be earning 
the, the, the four and a half, 4.7 right now, sometimes it's, it's five depending on the market that you can get in a six month treasury. And that's the worst case scenario. All right. Also, too, by owning direct treasury obligations, you're owning the safest government backed asset. Now, I guess the FDIC thing doesn't matter anymore because the Fed will bail you out, but let's just not assume that's going to keep happening. Um, so it's better than FDIC insurance. It's a direct government obligation. All right. So um, some retirees, one of the things you can look to do is buy some of these annuities where they're locking in 5% for five years, especially with, with AAA rated and AA rated mutual life insurance companies. So, you know, your Mass Mutual, Nationwide, Pacific Life, Northwestern, uh, New York Life, those are the companies I wouldn't mess around with anybody else. I want a mutual company so that they're not, not beholden to stockholders. The only mutual company is theoretically owned by the policy owners. There's financial, more financial stability there and no reason, no need for the company to try to chase profits to please any shareholders because with mutual companies, there are no shareholders. All right. If the Fed caves and they start causing all these problems and they say the heck with raising interest rates, we're going to go backwards. I think you want to own silver. Uh, silver is the wild child, precious metal, and it's going to go absolutely nuts. I mean, I have some good silver ideas. And I've shared a lot with you. I'm, I'm a share owner in, in Sprott. I think they're levered silver, levered gold, levered platinum, levered palladium. I just think they're, they're a levered bet on that stuff without undue risk. Like it's, instead of buying options, you can own Sprott and be levered to precious metals. So that's kind of the, that's the vanilla one I would recommend for people because even like these silver mining companies and stuff, a lot of them are kind of, I mean, you, if you're a trader, you can definitely jack some of those pretty good, but a lot of those companies are just not run very well, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, it's possible they'd have some issues and I wouldn't uh, try to start, that'd be a whole separate investment advisory service trying to pick among, you know, junior and midsize silver mining companies, which are the, some of the craziest, you know, assets on the marketplace. But I think for plain vanilla like Sprott, there are some other ideas I like that are also levered and interesting and different. You can also just buy silver. I mean, the actually absolute safest thing you can do is just actually buy the metal. Um, and sometimes some people get greedy and it's not enough return for them. But silver is like a hypercharged gold, so you, you're going to get some juice. So if they fed cave, silver's where I'm at. If they if they keep this thing going, then you know I'm just going to keep rolling rolling into higher rates until we get to double digits and I'll, then I'll lock them in long term. But, um, but what I did also too, I mean, something that I did was I, I scanned all my clients assets. You know, we had uh, short term bond funds, et cetera. Um, I swapped those out for government only money market funds. So we had a, an asset called FTSM, which is first trust short maturity fund, very nice yield, nice, for, but a lot of the holdings in there are, uh, you know, corporate bond, et cetera. And I said, you know what? Just got rid of that and bought BIL, which is um, which is a uh, ETF, which is treasury, you know, short-term treasuries only. So you want to go through, check your money market fund at your four hundred one k, check your um, check your FDM banks, make sure you don't have two hundred and fifty in any account that's that's titled in any one way. You can have multiple accounts at the bank if the titles are different. You can have your one in your name, one in your wife's name, one in your joint name. Each of those accounts can have its own two hundred and fifty limit. But be careful, you know, watch out, make sure you're not over any limits on those. Um, and then uh, look at all your assets. I mean, it's possible, you know, make sure you, you have locked, you've locked in debt stuff. You don't have crazy variable rates. If you are have credit card debt at 17% and you've got, and you're earning 3% on your cash, you get a lot of it, pay it off. Uh, check your life insurance policies. If Make sure you're with a very strong mutual life insurance company, if, especially if you have a cash value. But you also want to make sure that, any insurance companies that are backing your family up are AAA rated. You know, you want a company like Mass Mutual that survived, you know, Bernie Madoff and stuff like that. Uh, you don't want a sketchy company that's investing all the money in junk bonds, uh, you know, in, with, with certain, certain risks. So those are some of the action items you can take advantage of. But just realize that if, if, the, if, if the Fed were to pivot, you know, which, which you got a small taste of it this week where you, the Fed went into action and stimulated and, and came with a bailout plan for, for these two, these, you know, for Silicon Valley Bank, you saw how gold and Bitcoin reacted. If we had a, a real serious change in, in, in Fed um, behavior, you know, I would expect silver to go from 20 to 40. And so therefore, you know, leveraged silver would be out of, out of control, you know, long dated call options and silver would be crazy. And just owning silver, nothing wrong with earning hundred percent. I, I think, that is very likely to happen. And then all commodities, really. 
you know, because uh, that's going to drive down the value of the dollar and then global energy. Um, I also think at some point, you know, energy prices have been dropping. I didn't talk about it much and didn't plan to, but, you know, this is crude oil, which has been dropping uh, and, you know, probably with with less demand and this and this idea of of uh, we've had a warm, pretty warm winter. Uh, so natural gas and oil for heating demand has been down. Uh, your economy has been contracting a bit in, in many places. So you know, tra transport needs, et cetera, have been down. But I think medium term, the, the, this this uh, middle class revolution I'm talking about, I think energy is a pretty good inflation hedge, and I'd want to own some um, some good stuff, you know, uh, in in that area. Also, too, maybe you know we likely see more U.S. companies exporting natural gas. So we have a lot of American companies that get stuck at American gas pricing, which is very cheap. And right now, the natural gas price is at um, you know two fifty something, but in Europe, it's still that the thing's still over ten dollars. Could be fifteen, but see if you just produce gas in the U.S. and sell it here, you're stuck at these prices. But as they add more LNG export facilities. It's going to number one make gas prices much more expensive for us in New England because all that gas we were buying at two fifty, we're going to have to now compete with the global market on that, and we'll start paying ten dollars. And you're going to see your you'll see your hitting heating bill quintuple. Thank you, Mara Healy. Appreciate the uh, uh, the uh, the fact that you don't want to add any more gas pipelines to here, and you want us to pull to Europe and just hope that uh, you know renewables uh, will take care of things, which uh, didn't really work too well this year in Europe, but. Um, but just realize that uh, you know that investing maybe in some U.S. or Canadian-based natural gas companies could be a really good inflation hedge for people, um, and hedge your hedge your own uh, heating bill if you heat with gas. So that's another area. So energy, silver, and I would say energy, silver, gold uh, would just go crazy. It's possible Bitcoin would too from the reaction, although Bitcoin's getting hammered pretty back, getting hammered pretty hard in the after hours here. Uh, we'll see if it. If it can hold this pop from this is the Silicon Valley Bank pop, if it can hold it or if it just gives it back, I'm obviously taking a shot that it gives it back. Uh, we'll see what happens. But generally speaking, the Fed is trapped. They got nowhere to go. And they're either going to break more things with higher interest rates or they're going to turn around and, and be okay with, in, with inflation and just find some way to justify it through some ridiculously spe ridiculously worded speech they come up with. So it's one way or the other. The only challenge for the short term, though, is is that Jerome Powell has said many times he is not Arthur. He does not want to be Arthur Burns. He doesn't want to be the Fed chairman in the '70s who decided to lower interest rates because he thought he had defeated inflation. He doesn't want to be that guy. He he admires Paul Volcker, so I'm just very curious if he's got the guts to be Paul Volcker when he needs to be, or when the politics get hard and price increases and more things start breaking. And people start complaining about their 401k balances dropping more and all this other stuff. Is he still going to keep the tough line or is he going to cave? And if he caves, that's the whole silver thing. But so far, that's what he said. And that's why I keep positions for myself and clients, um, hedges against bonds, you know, shorting bonds, because he said that. And until I actually see a real posture change, I want to go in that direction. And I think with inflation still clocking in at 5 or 6%, it's not the two target that he wants. So we're still well above target. And I think that until it shows something, which we wouldn't probably see until later this year, he's going to keep that that uh, tight policy. So anyway, hope that helped with some explanations. There's a lot of talking. But for a lot of you, uh, you know, I think I need to do this more often. There's a few of you like to hear this. Some of you can just fast forward through some of the stuff. But uh, I need to do more of this long and short form so that you guys are just, you know, kind of up to speed with what, what I'm thinking. And, um, and so you see some of the stuff that I'm doing. Um, if you notice all the clients who have accounts, I did sell that, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, FTSM was sold for everybody. I'm in the process of buying a um, bill for everyone. Nice, full, almost 4.5% yield. It's you know, pretty much owns three, three months, roughly three months treasury bills. So that's just, you know, you see that me in action doing this. Do that in 2008 also. Went to government only money market funds. We we did not get hit really at all as, as, as a firm with our clients in the 2008 crash. We just kind of sidestepped that because we saw that coming. And, and so just, and we, and we took action. So that's the whole idea here. And we want to be ready for the turnaround. We'll see what happens going forward. But I'll keep you guys posted. Thanks for watching. And that was a long one. I know it was a long one, but thanks again for watching.